On this episode of the 2020 Awards podcast, we're going to be discussing what some might consider to be Alfred Hitchcock's masterpiece, Rear Window. Now, she's just not the girl for me. Yeah, she's only perfect. She's too perfect. She's too talented. She's too beautiful. She's too sophisticated. She's too everything but what I want. Is um, what you want something you can discuss? Well, well, it's very simple, Stella. She belongs to that rarefied atmosphere of Park Avenue, you know, expensive restaurants and then the literary cocktail parties. People with sense belong wherever they're put. Can you imagine her tramping around the world with a camera bum who never has more than a week's salary in the bank if, if she was only ordinary? Before we begin spying on Rear Window, let's aim our telescope at Bradley King and his feature-length directorial debut, Time Lapse. Bradley is attending the Seattle International Film Festival, and his film Time Lapse screens on Saturday, May 31st at 8.30 p.m. and the following day, Sunday, June 1st at 11.30 a.m. here at the Uptown Cinema. Bradley was raised in Los Alamos, New Mexico. After moving to Denver, he attended the Colorado Institute of Art and the Colorado Film School. When he grows up, he hopes to be a combination of Harry Potter and James Bond. Is that true? That is super true. Yeah? Yeah. How are you doing on that? Uh, I would say I'm probably like, you know, 50% there on the Harry Potter and maybe 8% on the James Bond. (laughs) 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 Is that how you saw it playing out? Uh, No, not, you know, but I still got time. I'm still working. Just got to go to the gym a little more. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, tell us about time lapse. Time Lapse, yeah, my first movie, uh, first feature-length film. It's basically three roommates discover their old scientist neighbor dead, and in his apartment is a machine that takes pictures of the future. So it's a contraption that spits out a Polaroid sort of 24 hours in advance. And they decide, rather than reporting the body, they decide to hide it and try to use the machine for their own benefit. And Mm -hmm. because it's a thriller, everything goes horribly wrong. How could it not? <laughs> right. They should have paid attention to the dead scientists. Seriously. What uh, what kind of things go? What 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 do what do they do? What do they try to do with this machine? Well, uh, I guess the easiest one to point to is they just try they try to make money on it. So they try to lay bets, you know, because they can theoretically see tomorrow's you know dog race scores or whatever. Okay. So that's the that's the clearest thing I think you can point to. But the you know it's the movie in general. It's a cautionary tale, so it's all about people fixating too much on the future so each of the characters sort of has something that they're obsessing over kind of in uh in the future yeah i would know nothing about that sort of obsession so right. I, it does not sound like i would learn anything from it but yeah. <laughs> and and you you wrote it as well i co-wrote it uh with bp cooper who is also the producer okay you grew up near los alamos mm-hmm. so in los alamos yeah right? so you're probably privy to some of the top secret government stuff that happened out there back when they were doing nuclear testing and is yeah. that is that where you where maybe you came up with this idea like some kind of you saw you saw something that you shouldn't disclose <laughs> <laughs> i wish no they they keep a tight lid on that stuff I, I have friends from high school who to this day don't know what their parents did on a day-to-day basis really? at the laboratory yeah because they had yeah it was top secret yeah you know, and they can't even tell their family um i you know that's so weird. I, I couldn't. Isn't that strange? Like I, I would be like, well, I got to tell somebody. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, but I, you know, I, I'm sure my dad would have loved it if I was more into science. I obviously, I think, respect science and I'm fascinated by it, but I was a terrible, I was terrible at math and I wasn't very good at science in high school either. I was more focused on art. Yeah. Um, but was certainly. Your, was your dad doing top secret stuff he was uh well he started out as an engineer mechanical engineer and then he as computers sort of took off in the 80s he shifted over to that and i think he found a lot of satisfaction in kind of keeping one foot in the um the drafting slash mechanical engineering world and the other foot in computers and so he would support these groups that were you know drafting all this crazy stuff but he he worked in some cool divisions like there was there's a particle accelerator there and he worked in that division for a while and i was always ecstatic when they would he would be able to take me to the laboratory and i'd get to just sort of walk around i mean you can't see anything because you know (laughs) the fact that he could take his kid in that's the door you can't go beyond (laughs) precisely but i remember for me the 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 most mind-blowing thing was dry erase boards were (laughs) yeah i'm gonna date myself but dry erase boards were not in schools at that point and he had one you know at the laboratory and it was like magic I was like, oh my God, you know, this, this is science. That's you know? hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if you had a, uh, a, a time machine, mm. 
how do you see the box office of time lapse doing oh boy uh i don't know i it's already played better i think than i hoped you know i tried to keep my expectations low when we made it i was like i just want to get my first <laughs> that's, film that's out there as a filmmaker <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like i just want to get my first film out there and have it not be embarrassing you yeah. know i would like to just reach a certain level of 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 uh i don't know competency yeah um but especially on the festival circuit it's it's played remarkably well i guess f- as far as i'm concerned i've been really happy with the audience response and um in terms of box office that's tough i it does look possible that we may get uh, don't want to jinx myself knock on wood but us limited theatrical and then i could hmm i would say realistically hopes would be that it would be something like cube or time crimes or something where it you know it doesn't make that big of a splash right away but then later you know sort of i don't want to say cult again i feel like i'm just jinxing myself all over the place it's going to be awesome it's going to make a hundred million dollars there (laughs) i'm sure that is exactly what's going to happen now all right well uh we're actually here to talk about rear window yeah so uh just quickly uh, rear window was released in 1954 it focuses on jimmy stewart who plays a photojournalist with a broken leg so with nowhere else to go he spends his days spying on his neighbors across the courtyard and believes that one of them has murdered his wife the film uh, received four Academy Award nominations, including Best Screenplay and Director, but went home with none. Mm. Mm. I'm so excited to talk about this film. So, uh, but but I invited you. Mm. So I want to hear why you picked this film. Well, uh, I guess you know it was in. Influence might be a strong word, but it's definitely a touchstone for us in terms of our movie. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of things I think that, you know, parallels you can draw, at least in terms of uh, the themes of voyeurism and uh, the sort of one location in a way. I mean, obviously, their location is a little more extravagant than ours, but it really is right. sort of one, you yeah. know, set. Um, and yeah, I guess, you know, also I'm just an enormous fan of it. Like, I love, love, love that movie. I mean, it's definitely my top 10. So, what uh, do you remember the first time you saw it? Gosh, I I am certain I saw it on cable as a kid at some point, and I remember being scared. Like I remember oh. Thorwald scaring me, sure, and like well. sort of not wanting to finish the movie. I, mean, I think I finished it, but uh, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I remember thinking I want to escape this experience. Yeah, you know, this is yeah. terrifying. Um, and then and then I, of course I watched it in film school, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and and got an adult appreciation for yeah. it. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because yeah, Thorwald, who's played by Raymond Burr, mm-hmm. who's who's the alleged killer right but it's such yeah, a no great spoilers <laughs> <laughs> it's such a great moment though when when he f- suddenly puts it all together he's got grace kelly who's snuck into his apartment right and and they're they're searching for his his wife's wedding his wife has gone missing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and so the question is whether or not she's been st- he claims they've found through various sources that he's claimed that she's been sent out to stay at her mother's. I think. Yeah, something. And, yeah. Uh, but they're pretty convinced, like she didn't take her handbag. And Gra- it's great because Grace Kelly, who has sort of been, let's back up. So basically, <laughs> Jimmy Stewart has his hot girlfriend, mm-hmm. who's Grace Kelly, mm-hmm. and Jimmy Stewart is this adventurous photojournalist who is attracted to Grace Kelly, but. She's a fashion girl. She's a society lady. Yeah. And, you know, every time we see her, she's dressed in, like, an even more amazing outfit. And uh, and she's just not really much of the adventurous type. And so it's kind of preventing him, at least so he thinks, and it's preventing him from really falling in love with her. Yep. And because he's wheelchair-bound, she ends up sneaking over to Raymond Burr's apartment to see if she can find any evidence of this this, this woman. And she's the one who puts it together and goes like, well, a woman would never yeah, go anywhere right. without her favorite purse and without her favorite jewelry and without her her wedding ring. Mm-hmm. So she snuck into the apartment and uh, and she is pointing, she, she ends up getting caught by Raymond Burr. Jimmy Stewart calls the police. The police show up, they're investigating her. And then she points to her finger mm-hmm. that she has now put the wedding ring on. Right, and Raymond Burr catches it. He yeah. sees that. Yeah. yeah, and he sees it and then looks across the way and and stares pretty much straight into camera, yeah. which is Jimmy Stewart's point of view. And 
And, and for the first time, actually, the camera cuts to a perspective outside, outside yeah. of Jimmy Stewart's uh, apartment. Yeah. yeah, there's two moments in that movie where the if it was a you know if it was an electronica song, the beat would drop. That's one of them. And then the other one, uh, I, never, I never thought of Rear Window <laughs> those terms. But. Well, I feel like every movie's got you know just those weird moments where suddenly just like the you know all the gravity comes together yeah. in a little like yeah. black hole and right. just gets super sucked in. <laughs> um, and there's that moment. And then for me, an earlier one is when Grace Kelly, up until that point, didn't believe uh, James Stewart that anything was going yeah. on, and then. Um, and then I think she witnesses uh, Raymond Burr tying the rope on the big trunk. And then suddenly, you know, her tone of voice right. shifts. Yeah. And the camera pushes. I mean, it's very dramatic when the camera pushes in and she's like, you know, okay, start at the beginning. Like, tell me everything you right. know. Yeah. And it's so validating because suddenly she's on his side. You yeah. Know? Whereas up to that point, he'd been kind of on his own. with these. Right. And he's got the detective buddy of his that kind of doesn't believe him either. Yeah. And, and yeah. she's finally the one that is like, yeah. well, maybe you're on to something here. Right. Right. Yeah. There are so many great moments between the two of them that are like that and oh going back to the wedding ring thing the other beautiful moment or thing that happens in that moment where she's she's been begging him not begging him but she's been really gunning to get married like she really wants to take this relationship right. one step further mm-hmm. and so it's just a nice symbolic moment when now she's wearing wearing the wedding ring right wow interesting you know i'm going to admit that i hadn't even quite thought about that in terms of the symbolism yet i to, only to caught it on this this last viewing wow. myself so that's great yeah but anyway their relationship is fantastic and like the first time we meet grace kelly jimmy stewart's asleep we see this ominous shadow move over him right and then he opens his eyes when he realizes someone's there and then she's just in this gorgeous soft focus and she comes in for a kiss and i mean it's like an angel descending i mean it sounds ridiculous to describe it that way but really or a princess or a princess (laughs) 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 but yeah she's just stunning and she comes in for this kiss and that kiss between to me that's like the sexiest kiss in movie history it's amazing and it's not salacious there's just like a there's like a love between at least from her Mm -hmm. you know I, i think i think he yeah he never uses the word love but i think I don't know if his affection is ever really in question. It's just sort of like his I, his willingness to change his lifestyle to accommodate what right. she sees as like the furthering of their relationship. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that's what's so great about this movie is that because he is bound to this wheelchair, that she is put into the role of becoming the adventurer. Right. And there's that moment where she's over there for the first time and she's... Um, it's not when she goes into the apartment for the first time. She, she, oh, she runs out. She runs to leave a note. Yeah. He writes that note. Yes, uh, what would be right. done with her? Yeah, and yeah. she runs it over. Yeah. yeah. And and she just kind of naturally adapts to this. And right. so it's like so it's a side of her that's always been there, but it's the first time he's seeing it. Right. And when she comes back to let him know, you know, or to, she comes back, she's like, what's, what's going on? What, you know, what's happening? And Jimmy Stewart turns around and he looks at her. And he's got this new glint in his eye. Totally, yeah. They even do a close-up of him, I think. His yeah, appreciation yeah. for her sort of... And I have to say, to me, it's like it's the only moment I can think of watching a movie where it's like I am watching someone fall in love. Uh-huh. And you are just yeah. like, oh my God, he is falling in love with her right, right now. Right. Now he knows that she's the girl for him because she is able to do all these things that he wants yeah. to do. Yep. And then there, it even gets overt at one point where he had talked about, they had a, the argument about the relationship and he's like, you know, you live out of one suitcase, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and uh, that's my James Stewart. <laughs> it's actually, I can do. I was pre- hoping it wasn't uh, Grace Kelly. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but no, he, uh, you know, he says, uh, oh, you know, you can't live out of one suitcase, blah, blah, blah. And then she overtly says, look, I brought this one bag. Isn't it surprising that I can fit everything in here? Yeah, you know, and yeah. she is obviously playing a little to it, but definitely the, like you said, the adventuresome part of her, I think she's clearly not just making that up for his benefit. Like she's engaged. Yeah. Know? She's yeah, like in it. Yeah. And, 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 and she does participate in solving the whole mystery. Like it's not him figuring it out. It's mm-hmm. because of who she is that they're really able to start putting the pieces together and right right yeah I, I just I think it's such a great relationship film yeah for sure and, and and the you know there's all the little glimpses into the windows obviously which you know is like candy I mean every time they point to a window you just you just want to see like what's going on now in this yeah, spot you yeah. know um, but 
obviously Alfred Hitchcock and the writer did a great job of um, making a lot of that stuff either reflect what's going on with Grace Kelly and Jimmy Stewart yeah. or uh, or or be a contrast to right you know and like yeah. there's Miss Lonely Hearts and, and I remember there's a moment where they're I guess this isn't such a relationship moment but they've just been sort of devastated by Lieutenant Doyle or Detective Doyle showing up and kind of taking the air out of everything right. the final time is like oh yeah you know we traced Mrs. Thorwald she's blah 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 over it you know she picked up her bag and and it's a horrible moment and you feel really deflated and he leaves and then there's a party going on across the way and Hitchcock cuts straight to the party and it's a it's really you know, everything's happy and lively and it's a and it's a great contrast because you feel really low and sort of upset you know but again that's not such a relationship moment but I feel like he does that a lot, you know, where mm-hmm. they, they're either looking at Miss Lonely Hearts or, you know, they're looking at the, the newlyweds next door. And, right. and Grace Kelly's like, oh, something sinister is going on behind that window. And Jimmy Stewart <laughs> and we know what's going yeah. on behind that window. He's like, oh, you know, no comment. Right. You know, and it's, yeah, it's all those little, all those little, little candy like window moments are, he just plays them really well. Off, right. You know, and, relationship. And likewise, I think what's beautiful too is that all of those windows have a story arc totally yes and so like Miss Lonely Hearts we see her having her first date right and there's no one there but she just pretends to be on a date and then you know the next time she has a date it's some guy that comes in and he gets fresh with her so Mm -hmm. she kicks him out and then she's about to commit suicide Suicide. yeah heavy and then what stops her is she hears the bachelor up in the other place who's a composer playing his song and it stops her and she's like and then the next time we see them, they're together. Yeah. And and it's just and, and that's just one example. But yeah, everybody in that that you see in the courtyard has this great little story of their own. Yeah. Yeah. Super clever. Again, it, as we were saying, I guess off the record earlier, it's it's um it's one of those movies where I had to watch it a lot to start really breaking down why it was working because it worked so well that I would just kept getting caught up in the you know in the magic yeah, of it all yeah. uh, whereas a, a movie with a lot of flaws it's really easy to start picking it apart because you're not you're not sucked in every single time that it comes right. on you know well it's time for a break okay and our sponsor today is Movie Cat Trivia have you ever played Movie Cat Trivia uh no do you like movie trivia I love movie trivia do you like cats? I, I love cats. Every well, fifth Facebook post of mine is about a cat, basically. So it's got uh, it's got movie trivia set to iconic movie scenes as portrayed by cats. Oh my gosh! <laughs> so uh, you can download Movie Cat One and Movie Cat Two, the sequel, at the iTunes Store. Movie Cat, it's the ultimate cat toy. It sounds like the ultimate. I'm going to go download it as soon as this podcast is over. It's been strangled. And- Hitchcock is obviously regarded very highly as as a very technical director. Like, and I find it really interesting that this film it is technically amazing. Like, just you know, from the standpoint of we are always in Jimmy Stewart's apartment, we're always looking through that window with him, and um, Hitchcock has kind of had a little bit of reputation as being a voyeur himself. I think every filmmaker has a little bit of that in them, if not a lot in them. Yeah. And, um, but it's interesting to me, like, this is probably the movie that, of his that has the most heart. And I wonder if that's maybe from the fact that it is something that he kind of can relate to. Right, right. Personally. Yeah. A a theme that's strong for him as a person. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing is that I think, you know, we kind of get sucked in as accomplices and, and, you know, are we guilty of enjoying this this act of voyeurism. Um, but one of the things I thought that was really interesting was at the end of the movie, did you have any empathy for Raymond Burr when he comes in and finally confronts Jimmy Stewart? Yes, yeah, strangely, not until that moment. But right. as when he comes in the room, yeah. yes, I would say yes. It's very strange because he comes in, he's like, what do you want? What do you right. want? Right. Yeah, because he's, I mean, he is sort of a cornered man at that point. In yeah, a weird way. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There is a certain amount of empathy, and 
and it's odd because you know basically we've been violating his privacy <laughs> right and so there's like the little bit of guilt from like oh man we shouldn't have been looking at that guy yeah you know but you know he did kill his he did kill his wife yeah, yeah. so oh god there goes a spoiler sorry everybody <laughs> <laughs> so one of the couples in the courtyard has a little dog mm-hmm. yep, that yep they they let out in a basket mm-hmm. and they they put it in a basket they're up on the third or fourth floor and they, yeah. and they wheel it down using a little uh, weight and pulley system <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and the dog is able to go out and relieve itself and then one night they find the dog has has died yeah and been somebody strangled. somebody has strangled it yeah she's like what you know why did you do it because he liked you like neighbors are supposed to like each other why uh, yeah that, that that's yeah, yeah. And, and, but, and but it comes the beauty of that scene I think is that it comes at a point where they've kind of given up right there's again they're sort of deflated like something yeah you're absolutely right the, all the tension of there being a murder or anything had kind of dissolved Doyle yeah. had just been yeah. there and he says you know she picked up her bag you know blah 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 and then they're feeling sad the party's going on and Grace Kelly even says like we almost seem depressed that, yeah, that, that no one is dead that didn't happen exactly yeah. yes yeah. and then there's a scream yeah th- th- that, it was really the lowest tension moment I think beyond you know the first 30 pages and yeah then there's a scream and it's the dead dog right right and then yeah she says something she goes uh about the neighbors not caring and it's 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 a great moment again because you know it's sort of like oh you know maybe we should kind of pick up the baton again and sort of it's another call to action for them to to like try and see if there is a murder investigation right, right. and then a beautiful thing happens which is Jimmy Stewart points to Grace Kelly and he goes look look at uh, Thorwald's yeah. window and all the lights in the co- apartment complex have come on except for his it's mm-hmm. pitch black and we just see like a cigar a cigarette yeah, ember light up right. in the pitch black so clearly he's in there mm-hmm. but he didn't come out right yeah. so, so a sign of guilt yeah uh, yeah amazing although I will say uh, the dog moment there are very few moments in this movie that either push the fourth wall or like don't feel real to me I mean it's so tight but when they find the dog the person goes the dog's been strangled to death. And I always thought, like, how do they know that a dog has been strangled? I mean, if I found a dead dog, I just don't know. Unless the guy's a veterinarian, you know, I'm like, how does he know that the dog has been strangled? You know, or woman, I guess it's the woman that finds the sculptor lady. Yeah, it, but, yeah. You know, that, that's if that's my only complaint about the movie, that's pretty minor. She's obviously. the dog. She's, she noticed the ligature marks around exactly, the dog's yeah, throat. Right, exactly, yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> so the other great, great device is that... Uh, And again, I feel like this kind of goes back to what I was talking about with Hitchcock Mm -hmm. having sort of personal interest in this film, maybe more than a lot of his other stuff, is that the way that Jimmy Stewart figures out that somebody's been messing with the flower bed, Mm -hmm. because Raymond Burr is always down there tending to the flower bed. Right, right. And then he's like, oh, oh, go get me that. See, now I'm trying to oh, one up your Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> let's just he's like, let's oh, do the rest of the interview that slides over there and a yeah. uh, little box. That's pretty and, good. And so he, Grace Kelly brings him the uh, a photo that he took, you know, a couple mm-hmm. of weeks ago. And, and so it cuts back and forth between him looking through the slide viewer and the garden. And he notices that the gardens have somehow in the past few weeks gotten shorter right yep and so he's like something's something's in there something's not right here <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> and uh and again i just thought that was like oh that's something a filmmaker would have thought of yes right some sort of weird discrepancy yeah he even yeah like you said he has a little view master that he's sort of looking at a slide yeah and they're kind of like holding it up and down and back and yeah. forth and so you see it like oh yeah yeah they have gotten shorter right that was a great great moment I do like I one thing I really liked about it was that the you know the relationship struggles that Grace Kelly and Jimmy Stewart are having what Jeffries and then Lisa I think her name is the characters yeah. I keep using their proper name but um, nobody it never really it, there was no paper tigers it didn't feel like one of them was obviously right you know like mm-hmm. we he's got some really good arguments why they shouldn't be together why right. it doesn't really make any sense you yeah. know and you hear him talk about it and you're like yeah they don't, I, that relationship would not work if those are my friends I'd be like oh, sorry guys I'm not yeah. sure this is going anywhere and then but then her and then also the the maid uh uh, Thelma Ritter. Thelma Ritter, thank yeah. you, yeah. The they, nurse. The, the nurse. nurse, sorry, yeah, yeah. They both have um, pretty good arguments as to why he kind of needs to get over himself, you know, and just right. embrace this amazing woman that's yeah. in his life. Yeah, And 
that's great conflict when both sides feel right you mm-hmm. know and yeah it's not as though you're, it's set up from the beginning as like oh obviously you know this character's got the high ground and the other person needs right. to come around yeah. you know no I always love stuff like that and I mean it's almost a challenge too I think just thematically to have like a moral argument where you understand both sides of the like mm-hmm. well I could see why that would be a good idea or yeah. why it would be a bad idea you mm-hmm. know and it just I think it always makes for a much more dynamic film and, and yeah. story in general so right um, yeah you know it's funny but speaking about their characters I, I was I was thinking about you know the different neighbors and in, in a way I kind of th- almost see Miss Torso as being the strongest reflection of those guys because you know so Miss Torso is this gorgeous woman who you know prances around Dancer, in her underwear yeah, and, right. and, and like and she's always entertaining men right. there's always like a bunch of guys over there in the apartment I'm sorry go ahead oh uh, I've got an anecdote about her but let's let's get oh, your thought yeah. and then yeah but uh, but then at, and, and it's sort of like oh which which one of these guys is she gonna end up with but then you find out at the very end that she's been waiting for her boyfriend to come back from the war right and he's this short little guy yeah that's right and he's kind of right. like not who you would think she would end up with and to me there's something about that that was kind of like oh yeah you know Grace Kelly is this you know, beautiful woman, and then yes. Jimmy Stewart is this. I see guy sitting in a wheelchair, mm-hmm. and uh, you know he's kind of like a little bit of an inept guy, but he's got the uniform, so he's out there on an adventure. And this, I don't know, this is kind of like a weird little. No, like, oh that, yeah, I think that's them. Along with your wedding ring observation, that's another really astute observation that I don't think I had. I had picked up on you're right it's like they're very mismatched and yeah at the end yeah there they are together right. clearly very happy because there's like a guy in a t- like a, she's having a, oh. a cocktail party and there's like a guy in a tuxedo yeah and she's got a bunch of suitors yeah like as you'd imagine like you know right attractive businessmen and things like that around yeah that's really good yeah and Grace Kelly's got that great line where <laughs> she says something about like oh she's doing the hardest thing in the world juggling wolves <laughs> right <laughs> yeah she's got some good lines it's it's full of great lines and and Thelma Ritter is oh, amazing she's like so her, good. she's just quintessential the, you know sort of meddling but also got the wis you know the wisdom of the you know I, I don't know what the right word is she's not the crone but you know what I mean she fulfills no, that in, sort in of in fact like, she's happily married to the, some guy she has some that's ad- right. she dispenses some kind of wisdom about like you know back when I was a kid yeah you know, the way the, relationships are you yeah, come together bam like a taxi you know blah yeah, blah yeah, yeah. oh boy I'm not gonna try to do her but yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah she's great and um, yeah everybody in this movie is fantastic yeah everyone does a really good job I read this um, in an essay not too long ago, but just a slight detail on, on Miss Torso. I guess, um, I think even during the storyboarding or, or the script writing, you know, it had to get sent to whatever, was it the Hayes office or whoever was oh, running yeah, like yeah. the, you know, the standards or the codes. it's not censorship, but yeah, whatever the, the Hayes code. Yeah. yeah. And I guess they were really concerned because in the script it said, you know, this woman's prancing around in her underwear and in the opening she has no top on. And so they sent, and and I think, I'm not sure whether Hitchcock insisted, but they basically sent someone to the set so he could illustrate, look, we're going to be so far away, you know, this is all shot from, you know, telephoto lenses and it's going to be this big probably, but she's, you know, and I guess that sort of alleviated the, the, you know, the nervousness or whatever uh, about that, which of course now is hilarious that that was even an issue, but, you know, at the time. I kind of miss the Hayes Code. You miss it. A little bit, because I think it made for better dialogue. Oh, interesting. You know, because you had to, like, say things indirectly. Right. And well, also... Oh, oh, finish. No, I was just going to say, because, like, you know, you, you know, you always hear about, like, oh, I love that old, you know, snappy dialogue. And it's like, yeah, but it was part of the reason it was snappy. It was because you had to come up with a different way to say, right. I would like to go to bed with that person. Totally. As opposed to now, you can just go, like, I want to nail that. Yeah, blank yeah. Blank, blank. Yeah, double in, when as you said that double indemnity, like the dialogue in there, you know, because obviously they never show Phyllis and uh, uh, Fred McMurray having sex, but yeah, but yeah, the way they talk and and the way they get in and out of of you know either side of the love making scenes that don't exist, right? It's yeah, it's genius. It's yeah, really, and it kind of forces you to, to come up with a way to say that that isn't just a four letter word. Yeah, and, well, and and also you made me re- think that that sometimes. You know, 
obviously we can show almost anything now explicitly sexually on screen and mm-hmm. we can get away with a lot but a lot of times the innuendo of oh. what is happening is way sexier than yeah. us seeing two people grinding on each other and, right you know yeah yeah so I mean having said that I don't know if I would I like that we have the option of going either way, but sure. yeah, I would say they were forced to get a little more creative and, and, and allude to right. things. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, hear that? Bring back the Hayes Code. Yeah, let's so, do it. Let's start a campaign. <laughs> let's start a Kickstarter campaign. Um, one of the other things I loved is that the end of the movie is that Jimmy Stewart has to defend himself with yeah. his, oh. his flashbulbs. No guns. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I remember, you know, I've read a number of articles or interviews with Hitchcock where he talks about like, well, you know, give your people the props that they would have, you mm-hmm. know, it's like, and, and it, it is, it's a practical device. It's not something that like, oh, I'm going to go pull this flashbulb out because I just happen to have a camera. It's no, that's what he does. He's mm-hmm. a photographer. So he has this collection of flashbulbs and, right. and he uses it to save himself and yes I am a huge fan of sort of creative showdowns mm-hmm. you know and um, I usually don't like to talk about my next project I've been avoiding it in every interview thus far but I will say that like m- what I hope to be my next project is a detective movie and, and the detective never picks up a gun the whole movie and there's mortal peril and other people have guns right. and things but I just I love it when yeah there's some sort of showdown that is uh, creative and even though people use guns in my movie time lapse the end showdown is is um well i guess we can talk about that later but yeah it it, it I, I was excited to try to come up with something that didn't just involve two people pointing guns at each other i mean i find myself i can't go see any of these superhero movies because it just ends up like okay a guy in a metal suit is punching a guy that's invincible <laughs> right, it's like right. why is this interesting to me <laughs> right, it's like right. really like we, it comes down to like who can punch the hardest mm-hmm. and it's just not that compelling whereas yeah. like I, the climax of this film is so great and yeah. you know and and it is nice that he is defenseless you know and, yeah yep and, and I've, I'd kind of forgotten the ending and then I was watching it I was like oh wait oh that's right and it ends of course he falls out the window <laughs> right. and like ends up breaking his, his other, other leg, leg so, yeah yeah we're actually out of time. All right. So where can people uh, follow you guys? Right. So uh, social media wise, uh, we're at time, uh, timelapse-themovie.com. Okay. On Facebook, it's uh, just timelapse the movie altogether. And then Twitter, it's uh, timelapse underscore movie. Okay. And do you have a personal Twitter account? Or um, just... I do. <laughs> I don't, you don't know. know. All right, that's I think it's Bradley Dean King. I think it's my full name. All right. Well, send it to me and we'll put it on the website. <laughs> that's terrible. Um, no, no problem. <laughs> Most of our guests don't know. They they have no idea. To be fair, I have been reluctantly thrust into social media within the last six months, and I'm embracing it and I like it. But at the same time, you know, I'm I I, I became I was hyper focused just on creating for a while, yeah. and, and well, that's until probably, I had something that's to promote. Where all of our focus should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the pro- promotion, you know, it's not only necessary, but it can be fun yeah. too. I'm learning so. That is true. Once again, time lapse screens on Saturday, May 31st at 8.30, and again on the following day, Sunday, June 1st at 11.30 a.m. here at the uh, Uptown Cinema during SIF, uh, the Seattle International Film Festival. Uh, you can buy tickets at the box office or, better yet, guarantee yourself a seat by visiting SIF.net. Once again, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Movie Cat Trivia. You can find Movie Cat at the iTunes Store. And until next time, remember, it's never too late to start thinking about the past. Thank <laughs> you.